thank you very much. Thank you, Gisela. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to uh, the first in an occasional series of conversations that we're going to host at the Mile End Institute. Uh, I'm delighted that for the first of these, uh, we're joined by Gisela Stewart. Um, Gisela, and obviously the reason that we have invited her is because of her role in the referendum. But for me, uh, until then, Gisela was the face of the 1997 general election. Everyone remembers Basildon in 1992. They now talk about Nuneaton in 2015. Uh, but in 1997, the point at which Labour took Edgbaston was the point at which it was obvious that Labour were going to be returned to power after 18 years in opposition. Uh, and people talk about that election and were you up for Portillo, but the real person you needed to be up for uh, is Gisela. Um, she then became co-chair of the Vote Leave campaign, uh, and she now heads Change Britain, which is a pressure group dedicated to ensuring that Britain does, in fact, leave the EU. Uh, and she's chairing an inquiry uh, by the think tank British Future on securing the rights of EU migrants uh, after the referendum. Um, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes, uh, and then we'll throw it open to Q&A. Um, I should say, for anyone that has come expecting of a Paxman-like uh, inquisition, uh, my interviewing style owes much more to Jimmy Young than <laughs> to Jeremy Paxman. So this will be a friendly and... Uh, good-natured 30 minutes. Um, if any of you wish then to take the mood downhill, that's up to you. But, but we are going to have a friendly and good-natured conversation, uh, if still hopefully uh, reasonably rigorous. So let me start, Gisela, with <coughs> your journey. Uh, I know this is a cliche, but it is still, to me, every time I think about it, remarkable that the person who led the Labour side to come out of the EU is German. That is, that is still a sort of remarkable thing. Uh, not so much because you're German and yet you're Eurosceptic, but that you're <coughs> German and Eurosceptic and in the Labour Party. So explain, <laughs> e explain that journey. And explain not just your political journey, but your journey to a Eurosceptic position, because that was not so much your position when you came in in 1997. No, far from it. Uh, and, and it is a, a significant journey. Um, I can just say something else when you say about the, the, the face of Edgbaston in '97. What I didn't know and didn't find out until uh, a couple of months later was that do you know who the MP for Birmingham Edgbaston was in 1938? Uh, no, you're about to tell me. A man called Neville Chamberlain. And I occasionally have these, uh, when I go to schools, yeah. I have these sort of imaginary conversations with Neville and say, don't worry, in 1997, your seat will be represented by a woman, a socialist, and one born in Munich. But <laughs> it's okay, you don't need to worry. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of fully conscious of the, that the world can change for the better. And that the, that project, which started as a common market in 1957, was designed to make sure that Germany and France would never go to war again. Uh, what turned me was in 2001, uh, there was something called the Larkin Declaration, where the leaders of the European Union uh, said, we are becoming too remote, we're not close to our people, we need to do something about this. And the way of doing something about this was to draft the European Constitution. And that had all the current member states and the accession states, uh, the, all those East European ones which came in 2004, including Turkey. So it was a, a big project of about 15 months. And uh, I was one of the small group of 13 people who, under the leadership of Shiska Vista, drafted this European constitution. And it really was a tough job. It was a full-time job for about 15 months. And I'm probably one of the last people around who have experience in negotiating across Whitehall, as well as with 25 EU member states. Because I didn't represent the government, I represented Parliament. That gave me enormous freedoms. And I went into this and I said, we would only get this through Parliament if there are three things achieved in that. And one is a clause which says you can leave, so people can't say it's a one-way road. Removal of the phrase, ever closer union and a clause which allows powers to go up and down, because all democratic institutions have checks and balances. And it was at 
And, and I really worked very hard until about the last 72 hours I thought we could get something. And it was that moment when all the what I thought democratic checks and balances got kicked out and the EU just reverted to type. And that was a moment when I thought this institution is incapable of changing. But I thought, okay, that doesn't matter. Uh, the introduction of the euro then meant you could no longer talk about a two-speed Europe. It had to be a two-destination Europe if the United Kingdom had no intention of joining. So 2005, the Constitution becomes the Lisbon Treaty, and I almost got thrown out of the Labour Party because I thought there ought to have been a referendum on this. And ever since then, I've been trying to give up Europe. I'm not very successful at this, am I? Uh, I <coughs> had also intended to take a very low profile in the referendum campaign. You, you failed there as well. I failed there as well. And the thing is that, you know, if... Cameron asked a question which I thought was almost close to abuse of democratic systems. Because if you ask people, you ought to give them alternatives. Now, you, we should have had a referendum on Mass Street, we should have had a referendum on Lisbon. But he essentially said to the people, do you want to leave or remain, but I will do nothing as to what leave would mean. Which meant that we had to, because for me it was democratic accountability. I could not endorse an institution which I thought was not accountable, and ends up with an endorsement. So Cameron does the biggest exercise in negotiation, gets nothing, but could have this nothing deal endorsed and entrenched. So I end up saying, this just won't do. But I understand why the Germans can't understand why the Brits think this doesn't work. Is, is there a sense in which being uh, an outsider, not, not being British, gives you a different perspective on the British and their relationship to Europe? I mean, does it make it, do, do, do you think you see something about us that maybe we don't see ourselves? Yeah, the, the, I mean, I, I keep saying to both sides, the, to, the, to the Brits and the Germans, I can explain to you why you're not understanding each other. <coughs> uh, and the, 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 the real big difference is that virtually every other European country has seen the failure of the nation state. And the Brits haven't. So the, the, the closest they came was actually the time when I arrived here, uh, which was in, and there's no connection, I, I can show you. Uh, it was during the three-day week, uh, 1974. We had two general elections. Uh, Ted Heath went to the country saying, who runs the country? And the voters said, well, not entirely sure who does, but it ain't you, mate. Uh, and there was, sort of, there, there, there was a moment where the United Kingdom also thought that it required something to anchor it, which was supranational. But of course, the, so, so first of all, the Brits by and large trust their governments. They also have confidence that they can kick them out at will, because you don't have the election system with closed lists and perpetual coalitions. Thus, we usually have a clear uh, decision. And the third thing is that the, the, the British system is so clear that we do not give the state any powers other than those we've given the state. And that gives it a confidence, which a lot of the other countries have. And finally, and to me most importantly, <coughs> the British already have a supranational identity. They don't require another one. Mm. So I, can, I, I can't say I'm English. I'm not English. You know, I'm a Catholic Bavarian. But I can, with very, with, with utter ease, say I'm British. Because to be British is not a bloodline. To be British is a, a, a choice to values and a commitment to, 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 to a state. All of which is fine here. Now, so, so that's where the, the, the Brits are different. If you then just do the Germans, I, I did a big television thing uh, on, on, on Thursday night. And they had the deputy leader of the CDU and she kept talking about our commitment to the, the Christian uh, culture. And the any German speakers <coughs> say, what's the English for Abendland? No, no. But it was kind of... Uh, Occidental or uh, Western values. Yes, yeah, so, so, but these were Christian Western values. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I thought, I couldn't imagine a, a, you know, an English, a British politician talking like this. So, so for them, it's almost a moral thing that you have to be locked into something bigger. Uh, if you've got, I think, 15 countries as your neighbours, 
they, you know, to them the European Union is so fundamental to their understanding of what it means to be German post World War Two and post unification. Whereas for the Brits, it was always optional. You know, it can be, it can't be. You, you had a line I've, I've heard from you before about British men not being able to do leisure wear, which I <laughs> <laughs> now British men think they're casual is taking the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. As someone who can't do leisure, as someone who can't do leisure, I, I basically have two states. I have this, and I have Trump, and I have nothing in between. I, I, it occurred to me that this was a very perceptive remark. And, uh, but what do you mean by it? You, do you mean that we we can't do casual, but Europeans can do casual? This is something about us just being British. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, there's a, there's a younger generation who's beginning to be able to do casual, but, but just, just look at the average Italian on a Saturday afternoon who sort of will incredibly smart and casual. But then generally, you know, probably we started, but then David Cameron, you know, you, you, I, I, I did Peston on Sunday, and again, you know, the, one of the, the Tory ministers, he actually married to a German, so he should have learned by now. <laughs> but, but he kind of said, oh, I didn't think we were, we, we, we were very formal. So essentially, he just wore a suit and a white shirt and no tie. <coughs> right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not feeling at all awkward. But there's something else which a, 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 a colleague of mine said whose mother was French. And because she said that the reason why the Brits are very comfortable there's a kind of attitude of whether you all have to think the same or not. And to me, the definition of the British, and now we're going really deep down, is Elizabeth I, uh, how she dealt with the Catholics, which said, I do not make windows into men's hearts. So there's, there's an acceptance that you, you, you can think and you can have feelings and emotions, <coughs> but I, I expect of you a certain kind of behavior. Now, the Continentals deal with it in a very different way, but there is a kind of buff of tolerance of that, you know, you have your thoughts, have a dark or light there may be, but you know, you comply with the rule of law and you do those things and then it's fine. Um, on to Brexit and the campaign. There is a quote from you, this was when you, did a, you talked to the BBC, and you said, we were like the rebels in Star Wars. Mm. The Remain campaign and everything in its favour. Well, I, two questions. The first is, what does that make you? I always wanted to bring this Layla, but you know, <laughs> it's a bit too late for that. What does that, what does that make Boris? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. He wasn't Yodo. That might have been make you go. And, but but, but, it, but here's, here, is where the, here is where the analogy breaks down, isn't it? Which is, you say the Remain campaign had everything in its favour. Being able to choose the moment, lining up big names, putting a reputation behind the Prime Minister. All of that's true. But you also had large sections of the press behind you, didn't you? In a way that in 1975 was not true, it was much more one-sided in 75. Actually, if you talk to people on the Remain side, one of the things they found most frustrating about this campaign was that press issue and not, they, as they felt, not being able to get their message out, whereas you had no problem getting your message out. So if you were like the rebels, you were like the rebels with your own series of Death Stars, were you in the Telegraph, the Mail and so on? No, I, I think what you overlook, and, and any serious uh, student of politics here, uh, note that what they had, what the Remain side had, which was outdid any of the press, was the electoral data. Now, I fought marginal constituencies for the best <coughs> part of 20 years, and my most precious possession is vote ID on the day, because it's like a marathon, you know, it, it, if, if people don't turn out to vote on the day, it doesn't matter how much they support you. All the main political parties had the data of the electorate. We had none of this. Now, my, all my election campaigns, and particularly general election, is focused on the day to get out the vote, phoning, emails. <coughs> don't, don't wake up the ones who are against you, you know, let, the, let them sleep, don't ring them up, make sure your people come out. They had all that. We had, we had the permission to raise £7 million, raise it. The Prime Minister spent £9.3 million just on his last leaflet which went out. I mean, as, as you reflect and step back as to you know, how this was pitched, you know, we had an office in Westminster Tower, uh, so, so I used to go across the bridge every morning, and it was quite hilarious because there's Westminster Tower, there's the river, and over there's the MI5 building. So it started off that the, the fire alarms kept going off. 
the electricity kept crashing. Uh, at one stage, the li roof was leaking, and we had to get everything out. Now, for the conspiracy theorists, this was serious, except that I had been in that building before with a house magazine, which I edited, and I said, don't worry, the electricity used to go off there five years ago, and all this stuff happened before. But, you know, it's the, it, it really was quite extraordinary of what you had pitched against the status quo and the <coughs> establishment. And when the other side complains that they didn't get their message through, you know, <coughs> ever so often, you may have to question whether there's a problem with your message. Yeah. <laughs> um, you were on the bus quite a lot with, and with Boris on the bus. And I, I always thought it was a sort of almost odd couple. Well, I mean, if I, was, if I was trying to think of two... Who was the odd one? Well, I, I, <laughs> if I was trying to think of two politicians who I would not have put together on a campaign bus prior to this, you and Boris would have been high on the list, I think. I don't know. When you were travelling around, did you ever find yourself thinking, what is this? Well, I mean, uh, just, just to prefix that quickly, because in, in my, my plans to take a <coughs> profile in this campaign, and, and this, this is an unbelievable success, if the other organisation had been designated to run the, mm. the referendum campaign, the one which was dominated by UKIP, uh, you would not have seen me anywhere near the campaign. I would have fallen silent. I had intended to be silent uh, and, and not do much for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but it was David Owen, who in about February, who is a very old personal friend of mine, took me into a dark corner and reminded me that my day job was a politician. He kind of said, you know, any other job, you could make the choice of, if you think this is right, then actually you cannot not engage. Now, uh, if UKIP had got the designation, <coughs> it would have taken the whole debate in a direction which I <coughs> don't want to have anything to do with, and they would have lost. <coughs> the reason why we had any chance of winning, and this is where you write about me and Boris, was that we weren't the usual suspects. Uh, we weren't the little Englander, you know, both foreigners. I mean, Boris was born in America, uh, and, and, <coughs> and it kind of... Nobody could, I think, accuse us of that we're being, you know, kind of too stupid to know better. And, and you know, there was, there was a real sneering arrogance that the only people who voted leave were the, the, the poor, the uneducated, and the not, not very bright. Uh, <coughs> and I think that was an important thing. But the, the one thing which was hilarious is that my, my constituency, who, who actually voted Remain, uh, sort of top half, they, 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 they had got used to me sort of going AWOL when it came to anything with the word Europe in it for about the last 15 years. But they really got cross because it was so <coughs> obvious we were having a good time. So it was the eating ice cream with Boris, which was the, the real hanging offence, <laughs> not being out with Boris. But I, I tell you, that was quite extraordinary because the first time we went out and we went to Devon and... We had this ice cream thing, and you know, the old Joan Collins thing, never eat, eat in public. But you know, suddenly we had two ice creams, and I thought, well, I can just about eat my ice cream. And I had the tissues, and I thought, what do I do about Boris's ice cream? And this woman comes up. You, you couldn't stage this. This woman comes up and says, oh, Mr. Johnson, can I eat your ice cream, please? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, you said earlier you think uh, Leave had the better messages. There was a problem with Remain's message. Um, were there other bits of the campaign, the Leave campaign, that you think were better? I mean, did it win because they had a better campaign, or did it win because there were fundamentals driving it, which, <coughs> aside from a Farage East campaign, which may well have been too negative, that any competent campaign would have won? Or was there something actually about the campaign, you think? Because we were so on the back foot, in a sense, there was a ruthlessness in terms of messaging. You know, uh, we had one key message, which was to take back control. And everything else was an example of how you take back control. And we didn't say anything else. And, and there were two big television debates. And I remember, uh, after the, uh, as we were going into the ITV one, uh, I sort of said, you know, and, and, and if the write-up tomorrow is that oh my God, these people are so boring, all they can say is take back control. As far as I was concerned, that was success. Mm. Uh, because you, you just had that fundamentally, you, you could... Uh, and, and this was the nature, you see, if, if, if we'd had a referendum on something like the Lisbon Treaty, I, I could have made an argument. 
but you had a prime minister who, who just created a vacuum and said, you either have what you have now or, open brackets, close bracket, insert what you want. And that was from the get back control one, was the one where you say you take back control over your money, your law, and your borders. And these were the key things. And the other thing which is sort of, the, there's this modern mythology developing, that people didn't know what they were voting for. And you have got a whole debate now about the single market. And the, 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 the argument of the single market has become a proxy for those who want to rerun the, the campaign. Uh, the referendum, because essentially, we on Leave said, to, to vote Leave means you leave the single market. Cameron and Osborne said, if you vote Leave, you leave the single market. Well, to now turn around and say, people didn't know that voting Leave would mean leaving the single market. Really? Did they know what it meant? I mean, they, I, mean I agree with you. It was, it was an explicit part of your message. It was explicitly argued, I think, in order to raise the stakes by Remain. But did people actually know what leaving the single market <coughs> means? Uh, let me turn this on this head. Uh, how many people read the entire party manifesto when they vote for, for, for a party? Confession time, I've never read the entire Labour Party manifesto. <laughs> I've probably read the Tory manifesto more than ours. You, 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 you take a package. And in, in my experience, the electorate may not always be the most articulate, <coughs> but I tell you one thing, they're not stupid. And, and I find it quite offensive when they go and now sort of say, oh, people didn't know what they meant. You know, the, the Welsh referendum was won by 0.7%. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Nobody said, oh, well, let's have another one, you know. Uh, how much did Ed Miliband win the leadership election against his brother by? Slightly lower margin than 3.8%. Yes, yes. And nobody said, oh, well, you know. Well, let, let's, let's talk briefly about another part of the mythology then, which is the 350 yeah. million. Uh, is there any part of you, there must be some part of you, that thinks <coughs> this was misleading? When I first, I mean the 350 million was already part of the campaign by the time I, I arrived it. And I remember saying, how did we arrive at this figure? What is this figure? So you go back, you go to the Office of National Statistics, it's 19.2 billion. Actually you could say it was wrong because it should be 362 million per week over which you have no control. Now, if, you, if, if I'd put on 400 million, I would have been lying. Not true. But you, you at that moment say, yeah, but you get some money back. To which I say, you're absolutely right, but we get it back with conditions. We have no control. So if my, if my pitch is, what, over <coughs> what have you got control? 350 pounds a million is over which you have no control. Okay. I would spend it on the NHS, but ah. I'm not the government. Okay, okay. Well, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's come on to that, because there, there, yeah. there, okay. yeah. so there, are, there are two bits of it, aren't there, that are potentially misleading. One is the sum, where actually it seems to me it kind of doesn't matter, really, because even if, and this was the beauty of it, wasn't it, was that even if people in TV studios started saying, ah, oh, it's not really 350 million, it's 142 million once you include the... <laughs> It's still a lot of money, and to most people, most people are thinking, that's, a, that's quite a lot of money, and we're paying that out. And so it sort of didn't matter. I suspect you could have gone with the net figure, and it would probably still have the same impact. The other is where that money goes. And that bust and those posters didn't say 350 million, some of which may just never get anywhere near you. It was about 350 okay. million into the NHS. Now, are you, do you have any problem with that bit of it? I mean, you didn't stand up in any of these debates. I watched these debates. You didn't stand up at any point and say, look, actually, I'd spend it on the NHS, but it might not go there, and I've got to tell you that mm. now. Yeah, but I said I would spend it on the NHS. But what, what you take me to actually is, is, is I think, a, a really important point, and that is if you've got a referenda run by campaigning groups and not political parties, you don't have an ownership of the outcome. Mm. Now, if it had been the political parties then whether you remain or leave, you, you, you have that. But just we, on, on Change Britain, we are do now doing a, a lot of focus group work. And I can tell you, uh, because I, as, as, as a Labour MP uh, who, who wishes a continuation of the Labour Party as a party of government, I'm deeply troubled by the, 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 the results of the whole swathe of, 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 of Labour country voted to leave, even though the <coughs> Labour Party campaigned to remain. And we've been running focus groups across the country. The, the NHS figure doesn't come up. Even the figure doesn't come up. 
that wasn't the thing. And even when they talk about immigration, it's not the numbers of immigration. It is they want someone to be responsible for the decisions, and they think it should be fair. It should be equal whether EU citizens are not EU citizens. So yes, it's 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 a nice point, and I know that you know wherever I go, they will be asked me about that, and people have already made up their mind whether they they they, they accept my story or they don't. Uh, nobody here is going to change their mind as a result of what I've just said. Uh, but that was the reasoning behind that figure and that example. The, the point about accountability is important, isn't it? It's a, mm. it's a broader point about uh, we have a sort of parliamentary system. And this was all about reclaiming power for parliament. And then we sort of bolt on this referendum yeah. to which no one is held accountable for the result. Um, a key part of Vote Leave was presenting <coughs> a set of policies as if it was a government in waiting, but then there is no accountability for those well, policies. You have to, I mean, the thing is, you, you have to give some examples of the kind of things you could do, but you, you, you can't do uh, manifesto because you, you're not a, a government. But what's more is doing the Scottish referendum. Even so, the government uh, kept publicly saying that they hadn't done any, any work if the... Uh, if, if, if there was an independence vote. They did do some work. They just did in such a way that if you put an FII request, you wouldn't get anything out of it. Uh, but with this one, they genuinely didn't. Now, mm. if you have a general election, you even get a bunch of civil servants who have to prepare of what a Lib Dem government would yeah. be like. So I, I think <coughs> in, in terms of... It's still a bit too early because people really do feel hurt and bruised over this. You know, we're, we're not in a rational state yet from, by any means in terms of talking about this. But Parliament has to come back and say, if we're going to go on this down this road of referenda, whether it's for elected mayors, you know, you had referenda about mayor but not police commissioners, all kinds of things. How does this fit in to our parliamentary system? <coughs> and who is responsible for the outcome? Well, isn't one of the ironies, the sort of Brexit irony, really, that it's all about regaining power, and yet the government's position is there's not going to be a vote on this outcome. And is that your, are you happy with that position that there will be no parliamentary vote either before Article 50 or once Article 50 has been triggered, <coughs> some vote on the final terms of the deal? I think you, I think there will be occasions after you've triggered Article 50 where Parliament will want to express its view. But those... But, but, but there's express its view and there's vote and they're two different things, aren't they? And I just wonder whether you think there should be a vote or just a debate. I keep, I keep wondering what would you do if you hadn't taken Parliament with you? I mean, and, 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 and the, the government would have to judge at that time as to what the mood of the House is. But in a sense, at the <coughs> moment, all the talk about triggering Article 50 on a parliamentary debate, some, some are more open about this. They just want to reopen mm. the debate. Now, as far as I, 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 I regret the fact that we're talking about Brexit. I, I don't like that term. I, I prefer that to leave. The country has voted to leave, and the way you leave is you trigger, trigger Article mm. 50. Well, it strikes me that a, a, a debate before triggering Article 50 is pretty pointless because. What, what are you going to talk about? Well, and, and also, the government have said they want to do it by March. The idea they're going to lose a vote on doing it by the end of March is for the yeah. birds. But on the terms, on what comes out of the post-Article 50 discussions, that strikes me as more but, interesting. But it won't be as clear-cut as you think it is. And it comes back to, as I said to you before, I'm probably one of the few people who has done negotiations <coughs> across Whitehall and across the EU. And you will find, you know, what, what we did with, with that point, we had a joint committee, uh, we kept feeding back as to where we are. Uh, but treaty negotiations are nothing is agreed until everything's agreed and everything's agreed and you know in one go and that requires to to kind of play poker in in some sense and in the <coughs> final stages but i do think that it's now up to the government to to start to come out with some broad principles of how they want to negotiate that and and you know, immigration is your first one where i think they need to uh, make it absolutely clear that any rights acquired up to to the referendum or even later uh, are honoured just as we expect them to be honoured over in, in, in... But why should, they, why should they do that before other EU countries agree the reciprocity? Uh, I mean, isn't, isn't Liam, I, mean, I know it sounds brutal of Liam Fox, but isn't he quite right, really, that this is an obvious 
bargaining card, why would we possibly give that away at this stage? Because <coughs> I don't have a problem bargaining over uh, trading standards on car engines. I do have a problem with using people as bargaining cards in that kind of thing. All, this, all the political parties have said that this is what we expect. Uh, there's no party political differences. And I think it would set the tone of the debates with other EU countries, I think, in a, in a very significant <coughs> way, because we would expect the same for UK citizens. Okay. And I think if, 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 if we make the first move, I think it will be quite a powerful statement of intention. Um, in terms of tone, uh, reaction of other Labour MPs, almost all of whom were remain, <coughs> to you since... I mean, before this vote, you and the other handful of Eurosceptic <coughs> Labour MPs were seen as a sort of interesting oddity, I suppose, within the parliamentary party. But that's because they all thought they'd win. And I wonder if their reaction to you has changed. I mean, it certainly has to Kate Hoey, for example. I mean, I've, you know, I won't repeat some of the things I've heard Labour MPs say about Kate Hoey after the vote. And I wonder whether you've had a similar negative reaction from colleagues in the PLP. I haven't. And I think there are kind of two reasons for that. One is, you know, when it comes to Europe, Gisela's always been a bit odd. Uh, <laughs> and you know she is foreign. So, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's been, I mean, even, even <coughs> with, with the whips, I've always had this arrangement. I kept saying, you know, when it's got the word Europe, you know, I'll probably <coughs> wash my hair. Um, and we never had any vows. <laughs> but the other thing is, uh, there, there, there are two other things. Uh, people like Kate actually did the heavy lifting. You know, I did the television debates. But I tell you, they are actually easy. To do 7,000 in Wembley is easier than a village hall with 200. Because it's a kind of one-to-one, -one, you've got to respond, it's actually really hard. You know, pe people hurl abuse at you, it really hurts you. At Wembley, they don't hurl abuse at you, it's kind of dark and you're just talking to... to. So, it, it was much harder for Kate and therefore I think she kind of soaked up much more of she just got in the neck much more, uh, and therefore probably would have been tempted to occasionally answer back, whereas it was much easier for me to sort of appear not to answer back. And the second thing is, I was, I was very conscious that on the 24th of June, uh, I will still be working with my Labour colleagues. So uh, I didn't do any campaigning in Birmingham, didn't go near Birmingham at all, uh, because the, the rest of my Labour colleagues in Birmingham were, were for it. However, Birmingham still voted to leave, despite my best attempts not to go near the place. Although Edgbaston, I think, voted yeah, to remain. Remain, yeah. 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 Um, <coughs> what about but the public? What about the public, though? That's the Labour MP's response to you. I mean, what's the public response like? Interesting. I mean, uh, Ed Edgbaston is made up out of four wards, which are very different, and it's the university and the hospital bit of the top that voted to to remain. And it was the, the, the working class areas, uh, car industry, all those kind of things, they voted to leave. Because Birmingham counted the votes in such a mm. way that we could actually see the wards, which were really helpful uh, to do things. <coughs> in terms of the <coughs> others, my own constituency was very interesting. <coughs> that you get the odd one where they just say, look, I'm, I'm really disappointed, which is sort of the... the the, the worst insult the British in the rather <laughs> understated way can actually hurl at you. Uh, in terms of social media, absolutely vile. By the way, if any of you want to write a thesis on this, I, I, t Twitter is already there, but in terms of just the emails I got, I have a pile that high, seven, eight arch leaf folders of hate mail, <coughs> which I printed out because I thought it, it required to, 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 to be kept. Uh, and there is a real difficulty that with social media now, what would be a rant in the pub over a pint uh, takes on a life of its own. You know, you usually sort of get the really nasty emails at just about you know, quarter to midnight. Probably already had a few pints too many. Uh, and <coughs> I think that is really unpleasant. And I just don't respond to it. That's not quite true. So sort of when you really got too much, so every other day I would sort of pick one person and answer back. Because, <laughs> um, you know, you need this occasionally. <laughs> you've, met, you've mentioned the Labour issue. Um, 
and the problem for the Labour Party, mm. particular problem for the Labour Party yeah. as a result of this fact. The Tories largely united around a new position, whatever the divides during the campaign. Labour has this deep problem <coughs> of the MPs overwhelmingly wanting one thing, the voters overwhelmingly wanting another, uh, no idea how to square the free movement single market uh, problem. It seemed to me the current position, as far as I can understand it, is that Labour is in favour of free movement but against the single market, which strikes me as a policy which manages to alienate the 48% and the 52% <laughs> simultaneously. I mean, it's a sort of... It's a, Thanks, genius. It's a strategic genius. Uh, what do you think the Labour Party position going into the next election will be? On the single market. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's obviously it's obviously a crazy question. It's a crazy question. Ha however, the, I think the the challenge for the I mean, the, the two things which which I thought were interesting during the referendum is that I I still contend that UKIP did not want to win this referendum uh, because you know UK, UKIP's existence is to fight for independence. And once you've got it, you know, what is the point of your, your party? And they went into the elections hoping that they could do to the Tories in England what the SNP did to Labour in Scotland, <coughs> only to find that actually they weren't destroying the Tory party, they were uniting the Tory party, provided the, the kind of the Maastricht rebels can not fall back into feeling betrayed because they sort of felt betrayed for so long. Uh, but there's a kind of unity there. Uh, and they suddenly found that actually where they were getting votes were in the Labour heartlands. Because if you, <coughs> if, if, if you're in Birmingham, for example, which is a red-blue city, it, it doesn't toy with the yellows much and, and things, it just goes one way or another. But the true Labour heartlands who kind of, you know, who would still, uh, you know, who, 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 who suffered the most during the Thatcher years, they will not go to the Tories if they're disappointed with Labour but they will go to, 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 to parties like UKIP. And that is the challenge. And the challenge for us is, is to do something politicians knew once upon a time and then we lost the knack for it. When I said to you about data, uh, you know, we, we spend our time going and saying, how do you intend to vote? What's your phone number? That kind of thing. And that's important for elections. But in between, you genuinely have to engage with the electorate and shape opinions, take people with you. And I think that's something we as political parties have actually lost and forgotten how to do. And, and part of what, what I think about Change Britain, which, by the way, focuses to bring Remainers and Leavers together, to work together, because unless, cause none of the political parties seem to be going to actually heal this divide and, and heal it we must, uh, is that kind of genuine engagement and say to people, if you're worried about immigration, <coughs> don't do what we've done for too long and just say, oh, you're just a racist. No, you're not. Tell us what you're worried about. Um, final question, and then we'll throw it open to comments from the floor. Um, you did an interview with Politics Home, I think, uh, and you said that when we try and frame the outcome that we want from this, we have to respond with humility, responsibility, and with open minds. Mm -hmm. So, uh, asking you for a bit of humility and an yeah. open mind, which bit of the outcome of the referendum, or what's followed from the outcome, do you most regret? Oh, the, the fact that uh, since the 24th of June, I almost go back to my copy of Kubler Ross on death and dying, uh, because this has not been a response to a political democratic decision. This has been the, re the response to a death in a family. The kind of denial, the anger, the, the lack of, you know, it, it, I've, I've never come across a, 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 an occasion <coughs> where we won the referendum and those who lost demanded from us to just, that we should justify ourselves. You know, the losers were turning to the winners and saying, how dare you? And then people were saying, you know, you, 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 wasn't it terrible, you guys, you weren't triumphant on the Friday. And we were quite deliberately not triumphant because the very thing that, uh, the referenda divide because they don't, you have no, no party political tribe to, <coughs> to coalesce around. They are divisive. They, they do open up things. And therefore, you know, we'd always been very low on this and they've said, now we've got to take it. <coughs> but we were attacked for that. And it's still a kind of that, you know. <coughs> I, I read some, I mean, I, I read Nick Clegg in the Evening Standard today. And, you know, there's, I feel like saying, Nick, <coughs> you've just lost. And in any other uh, election, 
you you know <coughs> you you have a decision and people get on with it. But it's still nowhere near. It's still very very raw. And and I think the the more we can sort of bring leavers and remainers together in pursuit of a common object, the the more we have. And but but doesn't that require if you're talking about humility yeah. and an open mind, doesn't that require you as the winners mm. to give some ground to accept that maybe X was wrong or Y was mm. wrong. I mean, for, for which example, one? Which one? Well, I don't know. I, 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 it's, not, it's not for me to tell no, you, no, no, but I'm genuinely interested. So, for example, well, yeah. well let, let me give you an example. Yeah. Do you regret or do you not accept, maybe you don't accept it, that there seems to have been a rise in racist, racist incidents since the referendum? I mean, is that a regret? Is it something that you wish hadn't happened but you don't think you're responsible for? Or is it something you don't think's happened? I mean, where does that fit in post post-referendum regrets? I, re I regret that that A, happened, B, that I think when I look at the figures, and because just before we're coming in I was, I was looking at, for example, the, there was this, I, I was looking at some about the hate crimes, this is one, there was one report which said homophobic hate crime rose by 140% in the three months after the referendum. Now, quite extraordinary because homophobia wasn't part of anything of the referendum, not, not even UKIP. But then you go back to the figures, and the figures are an online survey of 467 LGBT people who selected themselves, and around 80% of them said, yes, we have experiences. But and and, and out come the statistics. Well, that, well, that, well that, that may be, that may be but, but, but I want to know whether you think it happened. I mean, do you think I there was a rise in racism? I don't know. Okay. I, I talked to my police in South Bend. The only, the only coppers I, I genuinely know, who, who's Patra now, I said, did we have anything in Birmingham, in, 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 in my part? And they said, no, we didn't. Uh, however, what I thought was quite extraordinary is that on those occasions where the, the, the couple, I think, in Essex, which were clearly something had gone seriously wrong there, the, the unified outrage by everyone, I thought that was the really significant thing, that every, you know, there, was, there was no, <coughs> this, this was outrageous and should not have happened. And that's why you know, we launched a campaign called Welcome to Stay, to sort of just make it absolutely clear. You know, one, as one foreigner to another foreigner, you know, this is an open, outward-looking country. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much.